call for extraordinary storytelling and as the world kind of goes a bit crazy how do you adapt your business message to be able to land given this new context and so I asked Sandy McDonald she's an author TEDx speaker uh, and her specialty is storytelling and she's going to talk about how you can start using stories more effectively so people listen remember and of course act She's going to help you overcome any of the fears around what if I don't have powerful stories to tell. She's going to give you some really useful frameworks. And I believe that now is one of the most important times to be able to tell your story. So before I hand over to Sandy, let me give you a little bit of context. So you're about to sit in on a session from one of our crisis reinvention team, but let me give you some quick context. When COVID started to seriously impact businesses, we mobilized experts from within the Dent community to be able to help business leaders like yourself navigate the difficult decisions across a variety of topics, including how to access finance and grants, to cash management, to human resource law, to marketing and sales strategies, to cool tools and tech that you can use from home, through to high stakes leadership, health, wellness, stress management, not just for yourself, but for your team and look a whole lot more. For the full schedule with more being added every week, visit dent.global forward slash reinvent and we hope you find it a useful resource. All right, let's do this. It's such a great privilege to be giving back to this community, which I joined exactly eight years ago in 2012 as part of Melbourne Group 2. Am I a veteran? <laughs> I think so. Anyway, over these years, I've never stopped seeking and receiving guidance from the collective intelligence of this group and the founders of DENT, and I feel a deep gratitude for your presence. So in this response to the KPI Crisis Reinvention Team invitation, I want to share with you as much as I can to help you in this very unsettling time, to think afresh about your business story and how you could use it to reposition for whatever the future holds. I want to show you how to uncover the many hundreds of supporting stories you already have that you can tell on purpose and in context to better connect, enhance trust, um, boost recall, foster a willingness in your people to act. But first, um, just a little context around the training I've chosen to explore with you in this video. So earlier this year, in response to the catastrophic fires that were swirling about us all over Australia, I got some really great advice from this community um, and decided to build on an existing training program I already had called Story at Work and redevelop it into another one called Changing Stories. Now, while Story at Work focuses on how to use stories to build business, Changing Stories is about how to tell stories that shift negative energy, ignorance and hopelessness to comprehension, hope and positive action. The training couldn't go ahead because of COVID-19, so now it's going online. It's something of a scramble, I can tell you. <laughs> but anyway, over the next five weeks, all the conceptual presentation training content will be put into videos, and I'm going to make these available to you as the gift part of the CRT response as they are equally relevant to both programs. So what that means is I can take you with much more speed in our time together to the practical part of storytelling by unfolding the story at work models so you can start on your refresh business story and gathering your supporting stories as soon as possible. One more point. I'm beta testing a video visual experiment with you. So it might be a bit clunky, but, you know, as they say, <laughs> necessity is the mother of all invention, and I wasn't going to go out to the shops and try and buy a whole lot of stuff. So I started my first business 43 years ago in 1976. So clearly there were no mobile phones, no internet, no personal computers, no emails. And then 12 years later, I, I remember in 1988 when the computer scientists started to talk about this incredible thing called the internet, but no one was forecasting the likes of Google or Amazon or Facebook, let alone their impact. 
Humanity really has been massively transformed by these Teutonic shifts of, of the relentless digital insurgency. But who on earth could possibly have predicted the magnitude and the impact and speed of the ex exponential shifts that we are experiencing today in our life? And we're going to be experiencing it tomorrow and well into the future because of COVID-19. And when we're faced with such extraordinary disruption, it's really not unreasonable that we start to look for certainty for what we can trust and we can believe in, regardless of the craziness swirling all about us. Now, I believe that story provides us one of these essential pillars. It's our longest standing form of interhuman communication. It's been used for all time to teach and guide and inform and entertain and persuade and influence. When we use it wisely and in context, it remains powerful communication to sell and to serve. So how well we communicate has always mattered and it will likely matter more now than ever in our lifetimes. So I want to take a deeper look at why good communication is so critical to how we conduct business and how you can uh, use great communication to reposition your business for this new future and the roles that stories play in that. As a KPI, you are well and truly in the game of serving and selling. And both are enacted through communication. It's an exchange of value, so you have to communicate to do that. We serve by sharing our intellectual property as free gifts, content, events, videos, webinars, Facebook lives. But we also serve by what we do to enrich and enhance and transform or even save lives. And during this process, our success at it is largely contingent on how well we communicate. We also th sell through all of those tactics and through our collateral, our websites, our meetings, our proposals, etc. So let me share with you the communication matrix. Now this is my beta testing stuff, so it could go awry, just bear with me please. So the matrix is through the lens of communication, has on the upright selling and on the bottom line serving. Um, and it measures our communication through low and high. So in the low, low quadrant, low serving, low selling, um, this is communication that is often the domain, the realm of politicians. It's communication that obfuscates and it's scattergun, all things to all people. Politicians often demonstrate obfuscation. They say an awful lot and they're not really saying very much at all. And this neither sells or serves, and it doesn't position anything of any value. It's also in the realm of multiple possibility disorder, multiple offer disorder, which will always lead to competing and confusing messages, and there are really any stories. So the outcome when you communicate in low serving and low selling is that there is no evidence of purpose. Uh, there's no relevance to a clearly defined niche. It's aimed broadly at everything and about every everything, everyone and about everything. It lacks insight and it doesn't work to build trust and relationships. So when we move across to the high serving, low selling in, through the lens of communication, this is bleeding heart territory great services, dedicated to making a difference, overly generous with a huge volume of free information, but the communication emanating from this space feels opaque because there's so often uh, no clear intention, no call to action, and, and that can often leave the audience distrustful and, and wondering where is there a sale coming. There are stories, but they're not always connected. I call it disparate story syndrome, and it doesn't lead the audience with a clear purpose along a clearly defined pathway to a definite destination. So when we're in the uh, low selling, high serving area, the outcome here is that there may be purpose, 
but overall the communication creates ambivalence and a lack of clarity and even a wariness in the audience. So then we move up to the uh, high-selling, low-serving quadrant. This is where we meet the gurus and at the extreme, the snake oil merchants. They are masters of coercion. Get this or there'll be consequences and exclusion. It's my way or the highway. Their mantras, fear and greed, FOMO, fear of missing out, is the drug they sell and succeed with because we greatly fear being excluded. Their communications are made up of endless lists and features and benefits and each is a tentacle to pull you in to purchase something that will very unlikely serve you and even less so lead you to the gates of the million-dollar heaven, they promise. The outcome of low, um, low serving and high selling is that while this communication is extremely coherent, the only purpose is to make money and the stories are, well, usually fake. So where we want to go is in the high, high quadrant. That's high serving and high selling. This is the domain of clear-sighted, visionary entre entrepreneurs who understand the value they have to offer and they care about the people to whom they offer it. They tell their stories that are contextualized, they're on purpose, they're told with clarity and relevance to their people with a really clear intention that demonstrates their unique value to both serve and sell. So the outcomes when you are in the high quadrant, uh, high serving and high selling, is that your communication is story-based. It's on purpose. It emanates from curiosity and from empathy. It positions the business for the future. These are the stories that hold attention. They connect they build trust, they boost recall, and they promote action. And this is how story works. When story is contextualized, that means it's on purpose, it's told against principles, it's to the right people for the right intention, uh, and it demonstrates your unique value. It can only be in the high-selling, high-serving quadrant, which makes for good and powerful communication. How we communicate really does matter. I've already said it, but I'm going to just say it again. And the reason is because the quality of our communication literally measures the quality of our relationships. And, and again, this is how good storytelling works because to create great communication, because first of all, it eliminates bad communication. Story doesn't coerce, it persuades. It doesn't exclude because in context it can only be inclusive. When the story's focus is the person it's being told to, it can't be dismissive. It doesn't obfuscate, because rather it demonstrates capability and authenticity and vulnerability. Good story is clear and succinct and relevant. It's never opaque. And the combination of these attributes determines whether you're heard and what you have to say is remembered. Story works to capture our scarcest human commodity today, our attention. And more profoundly, it reflects on how well you connect. This isn't just about another like or a follow or a name collected. This starts with a deeper connection so that you can more readily build this into a relationship and a sense of belonging, belonging to your tribe, your community. Story holds the space for a much more constructive dialogue that you can educate in, that you can persuade in, and that we're in the space in which you can change a narrative. Let's move on to the story at work model. The aim is twofold. I want to give you enough of an overview such that you can gather the component parts of your business narrative, uh, of your story on purpose and in context. And all through it, I'll point out what I call the story reflectors. Now, these are the big concepts from which you can start to gather your valuable stories to support 
your business narrative, to embed your purpose, and to communicate your value. All of this emanates from the hard work of clarity. My husband, Roger, and I ran a marketing communications company for decades. And when we won the right to do work for our clients, we would spend weeks, sometimes months, digging deep to understand their purpose. They really had one. Their people for whom they showed scant empathy most of the time. What they were trying to position themselves, their industry, or their, um, or their company. And in short, why they did what they did for whom, so that we could then do the brochure or the website or whatever. And after moving on from that business and having some time to reflect, I realized that the real value was in that work, that work of clarity, and the collateral we delivered was merely the cherry on the top. Writing the book during KPI, I, I identified three guiding principles for what I was doing, and they've never changed despite pivoting from community building, building websites, helping people blog, and now finally storytelling and presentation training. And the first was clarity, because nothing of any worth can be achieved without it. I'm not sure why it's not a subject on the school curriculum. Kids should be taught the process of clarity. So we're faced with too many choices today and it disables us. It leaves us incapable of being able to make a decision. And the same goes for our stories. We need a process to cut through. Working through clarity is that process. And when you find it, it's beautiful. So we need to establish the context for our stories way before we are concerned about the content. Same goes for any form of communication, to be honest. It, it starts with purpose. Becoming clear on why you do what you do for whom is a muslin fine filter for all storytelling, for all communication, for all business activity for that matter. And as a KPI, you'll be well advanced in this work and many of you will have tackled it as an I believe statement. If you've been following Daniel's Facebook lives during this early period of COVID-19, you'll have heard him telling you to use this time to take a moment and review your big picture, your purpose, and your vision. And this is another opportunity to do that, to reevaluate your I believe statement. Does it still hold good? Are you still driven by it? In the coaching I do, I've discovered that many regularly conflate purpose, vision, and mission. So some years ago, I went to a conference on culture where we were invited to participate in an unconference. I'd never heard of anything like that. So I, I wrote up purpose versus mission, principle versus values, as I could see it was a topic that people were wrestling to find clarity on. And in, in the session, which I ended up facilitating, which was a little bit scary, people waxed on about their purpose, but it was what they did, not why they did it. So there were like great words like honesty and diversity and inclusivity were just being woven into the sticky web of obfuscation. And I, I just couldn't make any sense of it. It was a cacophony of fatuity, a nightmare. No storytelling of any worth was ever going to emerge from this mess. So since then, I've done a huge amount of research to try and get some coherence on this. And I can tell you there's none, not from big corporates to entrepreneurs to not-for-profits. Everyone has got sharply divergent views. So I created my own. I work with this structure as it's what makes the most sense, especially in the context of storytelling. Purpose is why you do what you do. Mission is how and what you do and vision is your big aspirational goal. I found an example from a biotech company which I thought perfectly illustrates the structure. Purpose, save lives. That's what gets them all up and drives them. Mission, by developing an artificial kidney. And it went on to describe how they did that uh, in terms of the principles. And a vision, a world in which no one died of kidney disease or had to have dialysis because of an artificial kidney. Can you recall when you were newly in love, how one-eyed you were? Like the endless specu speculation about how it would play out, how you'd make Amazon leaps in your imagination, your entire life mapped out. 
every moment fueled by extraordinary energy, moments of rapture so sublime that everything felt aligned and in harmony. Helen Fisher is one of the earliest TED talkers. Her talk, The Brain in Love, was over an hour long. Ted now spouses talks that are as short as two minutes, which tells you a lot about our attention span. Helen's research was focused on how love impacts on, our, on the brain. With amazement, she explained that during her research, she'd asked a starry-eyed lover if they die for their adored one. And she said they'd almost always answer yes, as if she'd simply asked them to pass the tomato sauce. The thing is that in this state of high energy, we experience euphoria, which isn't designed to be sustained. What keeps the energy flowing past the passion is a developing sense of belonging through our mutual experiences. Interestingly, Helen's research also found when they did MIR scans on mature couples still together, that the areas of the brain lit up like a firework display in younger lovers was still aglow. How comforting is that? It's their mutual purpose that is the conduit from passion to mature sustainability and belonging. And so it is for us that purpose drives us forward even when the passion has abated or matured. Roy Spence is the author of It's Not What You Sell, It's What You Stand For. And he said, the goal for our lives is to play to our strengths for the purpose of serving the greater good. When your business is at its best, you look for friends and you look for love to play to your strengths and serve the greater good. Do we look for friends to share what we believe in in life, in business, in our professions? Absolutely, because we want people in our lives who value who we are and what we do and want to partner with us and share it with others. Love? Well, yeah, I think so. Helen's research has an answer to this. As she explains, romantic love releases dopamine in our brains. It's a neurochemical responsible for desire and motivation. And so do addictive drugs. And so, in fact, does everything we want. Now, that's something of a revelation. What motivates us, what we desire, is determined by what we want. There's a lot of brain at work here. What it is we want to see change, what it is we want to see change, fuels our desire to do something to make that change, and that desire releases dopamine. And the more you fuel it, the more it will turn into a passion. A clearly defined purpose is where that process starts as it gathers momentum It builds a well of creativity and is powered by extraordinary energy. But the thing about being on purpose is that it is beyond passion. It isn't just about you all alone on your white steed changing the world. You need your brain on side here. You need your purpose to shut your lizard brain up. You need to keep feeding your purpose to build it into a rock-solid platform from which to launch your stories so that your stories release the other neurochemicals in your brain and the brain of your listeners to focus attention, foster empathy, and a willingness to cooperate. And this is how you reach out and connect and support and care for and communicate with and extend help to teach and how you learn. This is how you will keep turning the dial. Purpose is a powerful way to live your life. It sets the path and it guides you. It gets you over the hurdles and it navigates you continuously forward. Being able to articulate your purpose as an I believe statement is a commanding component of communication and of storytelling because it puts you and your belief and your commitment and your focus and your authenticity squarely in the frame. And because it does, it has the capacity to hold your listeners' attention long enough to persuade them of your credibility, to capture their imagination, and to enhance their recall of you and the change you're trying to make. If you can say, I believe that, and you really, really do, you'll be able to credit so much to what you achieve to its silent and powerful influence on you, on your choices, and how you communicate them and the stories you tell about them.
you will know from KPI principles or your operating framework, the, the pillars that support your purpose. They describe how you do, why you do what you do. Principles also inform the mistakes your people are making. The, the stories that emanate from this can be electrifying. I have a long list of what is happening to my people if they lack clarity. They're suffering multiple possibility disorder or disparate storytelling disorder. They're leaping from one thing to another. They're busy creating content and are all over social media, but none of it is coherent. I worked with a Pilates studio owner, and um, we identified language as a fundamental principle in her work to explain to her people what was happening in their bodies, push and pull and spiral and space. And she told me one day a story about a woman who came into her studio as if she was walking on glass. And later that day, after they'd worked together on her feet, she left as if she was walking on grass. Now, that's a very short story, but it's evocative, and it's very much on her principle of language. On purpose and clear about your principles, your stories should become self-evident and flow effortlessly. So the second part in the context for telling your stories is a deep affinity, building a deep affinity with your people, becoming forensic about who they are. And this is work you'll have done a lot of as a KPI. You'll be familiar with this intense exploration of their pain and the symptoms of that pain. But you may not have thought about the stories you hold that are attached to each symptom of each pain point and how you could tell them. Some years ago, I went to a seminar with a pregnant friend going through a really um, difficult mental health time. And she was concerned that the seminar was on um, what happens to an unborn fetus affected by a mother's mental health. There were two keynote speakers who took to the stage. One was an eminent professor of pediatrics and the other credentialed too, but driven more by purpose than academic rigor. So the professor stood up first and she spoke to her PowerPoint presentation, which she mostly read with her back to the audience. She completely misread us. We were not aspiring pediatricians. We were just concerned lay people. So she didn't elicit any emotional response in the audience. Then the second person stood up and he held us captive for 40 minutes of story after story told about the very things that would have been uppermost in the minds of pregnant mums who were suffering some kind of mental unwellness and were worried about the impact of this on their unborn babies. He didn't just tell stories to the pain of mental health, but to the niggling worries, hearing bad things, feeling guilty. It was riveting communication. And after his presentation, the energy in the room was absolutely palpable. He was spot on in the context for telling his stories. His life purpose was to support mentally unwell pregnant women. He was deeply empathetic, exactly to how they were thinking and feeling, and his stories offered much of value to ameliorate those feelings. You, we need to be very forensic in our approach to our people to make sure that our stories are relevant and inclusive of them. The third part of context for your stories is intention. The definition for intention is the act of determining mentally upon some action or result. I think it's a state of mind that instructs directed action towards a clearly identified desired reality, a purpose. Intention is a bit of a James Bond on a mission, so it, it's a rally driver. It can be fast and even reckless in its desire to reach the destination. And that doesn't always mean it's on the right path, which is exactly why it's vital to link intention for your stories to your purpose. Your purpose remains the same but intentions can vary based on the reason you're telling the story. Intention is what you want your people to think, feel, or do as a result of hearing your story. It might be simply to invite a conversation, think about an idea, or it could be to start the shift in a fixed mindset. 
But whatever it is, it needs to be clear. It's the story's call to action. My intention for telling you the seminar story was to give you a real demonstration of how powerful stories are when they are on purpose and focused on the symptoms of the pain people are experiencing. The fourth component of context is your value. How much attention do you bring to your unassailable worth, the value you've accumulated as experience, knowledge, and expertise? I want you to think about it as a tree. So the roots are everything that has happened to you to this very day, your culture, your background, your family, your life's experiences, your travel, your relationships, key events, good and bad. All of that informs what you value and what you believe in today. The main branches are your body of knowledge. They're fed by your roots and they're also fed by your acquiring talents and skills and experience. This is your current expertise. And the more you do and get to know, the more your branches grow. The smaller branches represent your insights. This is your wisdom. This is what you've gathered as a result of your body of knowledge. Insights are facts in context. The leaves are all the hundreds and hundreds of stories you have. You tell these stories, you feed the smaller branches, which validates your insights and feeds your body of knowledge. And then replenish daily by this, nourished by the roots, this fortifies the trunk, your purpose, why you do, what you do for who. I love this metaphor as I believe it evokes for us just how much value we hold. And I love trees. And if you're a visual person, I encourage you to sketch out a simple tree shape, or I can send you one, and fill it in. It's another way to uncover the many stories in the process uh, that you could share in context. So the second principle is curiosity. When clarity is elusive, Curiosity, the second principle, is its best friend. A good leader, and we are all leading in our businesses today, should be willing to keep asking questions in resolute pursuit of the truth, as only then can, can we be impartial and make the right decisions. And I believe a good storyteller has the same obligations and can build a university of all the knowledge needed to reach and connect to their best people. It involves fact-checking and accuracy and a commitment to checking your internal short stories to ensure a lack of bias. And then the second component is insights. From such profound exploration are the foundation for forecasting trends and new ways of thinking or, or doing. And most of us will have been compelled at some point to think or act differently by enlightened leaders who have the ability to predict based on sound research, which is why I think insights are so important. When you wrap a story around an insight, it is so powerful. Being insightful is the ability to communicate an insight, this fact in context, the causes and consequences of the fact, wrapped in story, and that's what makes it so compact compelling and, and memorable. And it's all at our fingertips, thanks to the internet. Now, some of you may know that I did a TEDx talk, Tell a Story, Save a Life in 2014, based on my experience of starting a charity in 2008. It it was a simple idea to get crafters to knit and send squares to my aunt in South Africa so that she could make blankets for orphan kids. But once I had an understanding of the extent of the tragedy over 25 million orphaned and vulnerable children in South Africa alone, I started to tell stories with that burning purpose and it ignited a global response. And 11 years later, a a community of around 20,000 has sent over 2 million squares from 71 countries to my long-suffering aunt and her volunteers and they have wrapped blankets around 100,000 children. I wasn't a knitter. So when I started the charity Knitter Square, I had to find out more about what made knitters tick just doing keyword research revealed tens of thousands of people who were dippy about their craft and desperate to make a difference with it. Their problem was 
their pain, if you like, was not having enough outlets for their work. And, and this dictated the stories I wrote as I had a solution for their busy hands and their, and their compassionate spirits. When you tell stories from this place of curiosity and empathy, your listener feels cared about, that you're invested in them, which makes them feel safe and builds trust, a sense of belonging and a willingness to cooperate. Exactly what the science of story reflects. When we hear emotionally charged, character-driven stories, it releases neurochemicals in our brains, which focuses attention and fosters a willingness to cooperate. That's pretty powerful stuff. The science of story is the subject of one of the contextual videos I'll be sharing with you as, as our gift. So armed with clarity for our stories, clear on the context, and fueled by curiosity, now we can look at the concept for them. It's a big topic, but in essence, this is about sorting out the wheat from the chaff to develop coherence, which is the third principle for storytelling. Without clarity around where your story fits in the scheme of all that is you and your business, it's hard to pick the key messages and vital points that would make it worth telling. You are telling your stories for a reason. It's to better and more effectively communicate with your people. And that's hard to achieve if your stories are cluttered with too much information, forcing your listener to dart from one idea to the next. So to gain clarity on the concept of your story, let me introduce you to the story trail. Now remember the healthcare company whose purpose was to save lives by developing an artificial kidney. If your body of knowledge had grown through that work of developing that kidney, then there are some big themes that relate to that work. Dialysis, kidney patient health, methods for surgery, the technology to develop the artificial kidney itself to the renal system. Now themes are more like the subject of a book, a conference, a white paper, or a keynote address. The topics for the stories reside within these big themes. Under each topic, there could be dozens of stories. So in this example, the purpose is to save lives. The theme is kidney patient health. The topic, diet. And a story could be a nutritionist who's developed easy recipes for people with kidney disease. Let me give you a more personal example to show how you can use personal story in the same way. I was driving my granddaughter to hospital to see her baby brother, and uh, she was wearing a new hat. And I said to her, Tully, that is such a pretty new hat you're wearing. And she said in her very best Bogan accent, it's my hat. And I went, oh, Tully, no, 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 it's my hat. And she was very indignant. She put her hands on her hips and she retorted, no, it's not, it's mine. And I realized that I was giving her an elocution lesson and it was falling on deaf ears because she genuinely believed I was laying claim to her hat. And it reminded me, if you don't properly consider your audience, your message will fall short of its mark. So to the story trail. So my purpose is to enrich, transform, and save lives. And how I do that, my mission is by helping people tell stories that will do good in the world. Um, in this case, the theme was that was my context piece and for whom, and the topic within that theme was misreading your audience, the story, Tully and her hat. Now, I love the story because it demonstrates how you can use a small family anecdote to fulfill an intention that matches your purpose. Misreading your audience or listener in terms of a topic is massive. I could write a book at it because about it because it, it sits at the heart of communication breakdown. But a simple story of a small child and a hat can deliver the intention to have my listener recognize that we must be mindful of matching our message to our audience. Can you see from this example that there would be multiple single topic stories in each theme and how you could use this method to organize your stories. So the last in the storytelling model is coherence. I say that 
Good leaders tell stories and good storytelling makes leaders. So when your storytelling is coherent, it's magical. Okay, so on the matter of positioning, I see a lot of confusion in how people position themselves in their businesses. Are they positioning themselves as the expert, their product, or their industry niche? Most KPIs get this nailed. But if not, then there can only be ambiguity in their storytelling because each of these positions would generate stories with a completely different slant and different intentions and a different outcome. And there's also the danger of positioning a number of different products and developing a branding hierarchy nightmare. I'm very familiar with this. I have been through this in my own KPI journey. It's a difficult area, particularly for solopreneurs. Clarity of purpose and principles helps to straighten this out and develop coherence. So this will shift your storytelling from ambiguity to authority. It cements your positioning, solidifying your brand, building your profile and embedding your purpose and your culture. That's powerful. A big factor to success in content marketing on any platform is consistency. You'll know this from all the work that you've been doing. The same key messaging, the same memes, the same ideas, the same positioning delivered with congruence is what builds brand and builds profile. But the beauty of story is that it can do this while remaining fresh and entertaining and evocative and meaningful. I write at least three updates a week in LinkedIn. Most of them, unsurprisingly, are stories, which at first reckoning you might think are unrelated. Here's one I wrote to promote a training program last year that I was doing with my husband. You'll recognize some of the themes. In our early years, my husband Roger, who's a gifted poet, no bias there, and I lived in a tiny little cottage in what was then Salisbury, Rhodesia, now Harare, Zimbabwe. I remember it had polished red cement floors and a wood-fired water heater. We'd been given a half bottle of Beaujolais as a housewarming gift, and it waited on the mantelpiece. We drank it on the day he won a coveted journalism cadetship on the National Daily Newspaper. The country was in the last throes of a really vicious bush war. Soon he was covering the war and politics, and he even interviewed Robert Mugabe after he came to power in 1980. Later, he went into PR and then marketing communications. Today, this intersection of experience means he can write books with elegance and convincingly on anything from fintech to fashion. Much of what I know about storytelling, I've learned from him to be exacting in your search for truth. And that's sometimes hard when it gets in the way of a good tale. How to weave cadence into your prose and a forensic approach to the use of words, eliminating any that are unnecessary. What have you learned from your lifelong partners or friends? What stories do you have to tell about it? We worked together for three decades when I was a graphic designer. I did the art, he did the words. Now we're doing training together. He does the writing, I do the stories. A natural partnership. Now, there's a lot packed into that short story. You'd also know a lot more about me and my husband. It might have helped you come to feel that we are relatable to, that we're trustworthy. You'll understand a level of expertise from which we could deliver this training program. It carries a lot of my themes. Truth and craft are two of them. Which leads logically to the last in the storytelling model, craft. Becoming an orator. Craft is about language. It's about using words and cadence and rhythm and structure. You will have heard excerpts from some of the great speeches of all time. One of my favorite was Barack Obama's victory speech in 2008. His opening line was this. They said this day would never come. The next line, they said our sights were set too high. What did you notice? 
there are eight beats per line. Even more interesting, when he said it, was the tone, the pitch, the inflection, the sound of the words. Obama wasn't just making a speech, he was singing to his people. He was uniting them in verse so simple that voices in the crowd repeated the lines after him. We use the rhythm of language as much as the language itself to transcend from the individual to the collective. Rhythm makes us one and words matter. We have really limited time to get our stories across, so we must filter our words, especially words that diffuse or obfuscate. Very, really, obviously, basically one of my worst. In fact, and of course, what do you actually mean when you're saying of course? I know it, you don't. It's exclusive. It shuts people out. You should be able to convey meaning without overuse of adverbs and adjectives. Treat the word but with caution as it qualifies the sentence that precedes it. Does that clarify or fudge the truth? The structure of a good story has cadence. It works through the status quo, that is the introduction. It sets the context, facts, time and place. Then it leads you to the spark, which ignites the story onto its journey. And then you go on the journey and then and then and then. And eventually you arrive at the resolution, the key decision. And finally, that allows you to get to the conclusion, the idea worth storing, sharing, which usually contains your intention, your call to action. Now, in the half bottle of Beaujolais, the status quo was the context about where we lived and what we were doing to the point when we drank that half bottle of Beaujolais. So the spark was Roger winning the coveted place as a journalist. The journey was what he experienced thereafter, and it led to the resolution about what I'd learned about storytelling and the fact that we were going to put on this training. The idea and the intention was to pique an interest in the training program we were do doing together. And finally, we are at content. Just like our marketing, where all the value was in the clarity that we did, the collateral was the cherry on the top. This is how I view content. It's the cherry on the top. After you have done all the work, the value is all in the work you do up front and the content, the logical result of it. So in summary, to construct your business story, I really want you to fall in love with your purpose again, get very clear on your principles because everything will fall from that. And then you can isolate three key messages that support your purpose. They'll likely tell a story about your principles, about how they work to enrich people's lives, transform them, support them, nurture them, educate them, even save their lives. Make sure you're very clear on the intention for your narrative. What do you want your people to understand, think about, feel or act on when they hear the story of your business? Is it important that you explain your history? Do you want them to understand your innovation? Is education your imperative? Daniel Priestley made a fantastic point in a recent Facebook Live. He said, remember, you are often only selling for positive signals in return to your communication. So do you want to create a business narrative that will generate a positive signal in response rather than sell your offer? What value will you share? This is about your story. It's not a brochure. It isn't a list of your wisdom, your benefits of your offer, the features of your offer. In the process, gather your supporting stories. Remember, you are sitting on thousands and thousands of stories, each one a little nugget that could uh, deliver a really powerful message. Perhaps the most important takeout from this uh, video is that stories have always been used to support invested interest. And it is in observing that, that you will see how powerfully they work. Look, sadly, it's, it's often only when really bad stuff has happened and we realize it too late and after the fact. 
Hitler was a commensurate orator. He used his stories to deliver simple messages that gave people what they wanted to hear, just as Churchill did. And Obama was fantastic at it. And Trump is good too. We need to become orators for our businesses, but also to do good in the world. We need to tell our stories to deliver simple messages of clarity, vision, and the reasons for collaboration. No one story will affect massive change. It is the cumulative effect of our storytelling that will shift the dial in your people's understanding of you, your business, and your value. And I think I'm done. In fact, I'm fried. I really hope this has been of use to you and that at the very least you now have an overview, a sort of skeleton around how you can construct your business narrative, looking at it through the lens of your purpose and looking at it with that future view of whatever the world is going to be at the other end of COVID-19 so that you can position your business for the wonderful, magical future we are all going to enjoy post this endurance, post this marathon that we have to go through. And I really look forward to meeting some of you on the other side. Bye for now. But please don't stop telling your stories. Remember, a story can honestly enrich, transform, and even save lives. Bye. For more expert talks, just visit dent.global forward slash reinvent because we believe that the decisions that you make now matter more than ever. We started Dent 10 years ago in the middle of the GFC in London and we shared the key person of influence methodology as a tool to be able to help businesses thrive despite the chaos. Today, it's a, a best-selling book and over 3,000 businesses use the methodology like an operating system for driving performance. And we've learned that regardless of economic conditions, that your primary focus as a founder should be showing up as the go-to brand, the key person of influence in your industry. More important than systems or social media, more important than Facebook videos or launching a website, the goal of showing up as the key person of influence in your industry should be the organizing force. It should be the primary objective that helps align all your other decision making. Because as your influence and reach expands, it becomes easier and cheaper to attract clients, team, media, even investors. When times are tough, it's the key people of influence that become even more valuable and even more in demand. And if you've been in business for a while, you're probably a lot closer than you think. So every week that this COVID-19 thing continues, I'm going to be hosting a weekly talk to be able to help business leaders like yourself recalibrate their focus so they can make the most of the times that we're in. If you're interested in jumping on a Zoom and saying hi with me, you can find the link to register for my sessions as well as all of the crisis response team sessions at dent.global forward slash reinvent. If you found this useful, let us know. My name's Glenn Carlson and please be brave. Have fun. Let's go make a dent in the universe.